Hello and welcome to Witness, the history podcast from the BBC World Service, with me, Mike Lanshin. Today we're going back to the summer of 1950 and the start of the first major conflict of the Cold War between communist North Korea and US-supported South Korea. As the war began, thousands of suspected left-wing sympathisers in South Korea were killed by the country's military. I've been hearing from the son of one of those victims. There were six of us in my family. My father, mother, one younger brother and two younger sisters. I was the oldest. My father was a farmer and my mother was a housewife. From what I recall, my family was quite ordinary. Our life was okay back then, but later things got very difficult for us. Guy Sung Lee is now in his late 70s. His father, whose name was Hyun Yo Lee, was executed as a suspected communist sympathiser in South Korea when Guy Sung was just 10 years old. The family's ordeal had begun with the end of the Japanese colonial occupation of the Korean peninsula in 1945, after their defeat in the Second World War. After 40 years of Japanese domination, Korea makes a start on the road back to national independence. All Japs, soldiers and civilians alike, have got the order to clear out. Even before Japan's withdrawal, the United States and the Soviet Union, allies in 1945, had decided that Korea would not govern itself immediately. Instead, they planned for a temporary joint trusteeship of the peninsula, with the Soviets in the north and the Americans in the south. When Korea gained its independence in um, August 1945, of course, it was immediately divided by the Allied powers um, at the 38th parallel. Professor Owen Miller, a Korean specialist at SOAS University in London. But the interesting thing is that after the, the Japanese surrendered on August the 15th, there was actually quite a large gap until the US troops arrived to occupy the southern occupation zone. And in that time, <clears throat> Koreans began to set up their own organs of government, and these were generally known as the People's Committees, and they even began in early September to establish a sort of nationwide government. But once the Americans arrived, they wanted to impose their own military government, and they proceeded then to basically attempt to abolish the People's Committees. By the time the Americans arrived in South Korea in September 1945, the Soviet Union had already installed a communist leadership in the North. The battle lines of the Cold War were being drawn on the Korean peninsula. This is a point at which the Cold War is just beginning to emerge, but I think it was pretty clear already to the Americans that they did not want uh, communists taking over in the southern zone. They wanted the whole of Korea ultimately to be friendly to the US. So they were immediately suspicious, not just of self-declared communists, but of, of anyone on the sort of left side of, of Korean politics. And they began very early on to try to ally themselves with more uh, right-wing forces within Korean society. As a pro-independent supporter and a nationalist, Guy Sung's father was a member of one of the People's Committees in his hometown of Nam Wong. In November of 1945, he was arrested after trying to stop police capturing a group of his fellow committee members. He served six months in jail. In 1947, Guy Sung's father was arrested again. This time he was charged in connection with the murder of the head of a right-wing youth association by leftists. He was sent to the Daejeon jail in the south of the country. I don't really remember much, but after the incident, people from the youth association broke into our house, smashed our jars and threw our blankets on the floor. I saw all that. After that, we couldn't live at home anymore. Guy Sung's mother was too frightened to tell her children about their father's arrest. But she did begin visiting him in Daejeon jail. And in early 1950, she took Guy Sung with her. It was a 200-kilometre train journey for them to get to the prison. Mm. I went by train to the prison. I went holding my mother's hand. I remember seeing a big well with a bucket inside the prison, also a watchtower. My father shook hands with me. I remember he was all swollen compared to how he used to look. Maybe it was because he had been tortured. 
It was the last time that father and son would see each other. Soon the entire Korean peninsula was thrown into war. Close on the heels of discussions of Far East strategy by Generals MacArthur and Bradley comes news that communist troops have invaded southern Korea. In, In June of 1950, with the backing of the Soviet Union and China, North Korea's leader, Kim Il-sung, sent his troops south. Seoul was soon overrun. Once in control of the city, the North Korean forces began emptying the prisons, hoping to gain thousands of new recruits. The government in the south feared being overwhelmed and reacted brutally in the areas it still controlled. The Syngman-ri government then decided that the safest thing to do was to take the political prisoners out of the prisons and kill them. As many as 100,000 prisoners are believed to have been killed by the police and army of South Korea in an attempt to stop them reinforcing the invading army from the north. It seems to have been done very systematically. It seems to have been done from you know, down the chain of command to local prison um, officers, to local um, police and army officers who then carried out these massacres. And they were done on a sort of very systematic basis. Over a series of days, people were taken from the prison, in the case of Daejeon, to the site in the hills where a huge grave had been dug and, and they were then shot in the head and buried. Gai Sung's father was among the victims. Later it emerged that an American officer had taken photos at the scene of one of the mass killings, black and white pictures showing detainees bent down, submissive, hands bound, waiting to be shot. The pictures were kept classified by the US government for decades. I had no idea that my father had died. Speaking about something like that was forbidden. It was secret. A prison officer told my mother that he was taken to Golyongol mountain valley and was killed. He was categorised as a so-called thought criminal, so he was put in the first group for killing. He was shot dead on June the 28th. The family spent the rest of the Korean War moving from place to place, keeping their heads down, never speaking about their past. An armistice ended the fighting in 1953, but even then it would take decades until Gai Sung felt able to broach the subject of his father with his mother. In 2008, after the advent of democratic government in South Korea, an official truth commission at last investigated the killings, and the president issued an apology to some of the families. Six years later, the Lee family received compensation. During the Korean War, tens of thousands of civilians also died at the hands of the communist North Koreans. But the brutal murder of their own citizens by the South Korean military is still, even today, not widely talked about in the South. Gai Sung says that he still seeks to vindicate fully his father's name. When I was young, I used to blame my father for what had happened. However, after studying Korea's modern history, I realised that he was neither a communist nor a socialist. He was a nationalist. And for that I respect him. Gai Sung Lee was speaking from South Korea to me, Mike Lanchin, for this Witness podcast. And if you'd like a free daily download of all our programmes, just search online for BBC Witness Podcast. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.